from the headquarters of Telesur English in Caracas, Venezuela. I'm Carla Gonzalez and this is From the South. We begin with Venezuela. A group of almost 90 Venezuelan migrants in Ecuador are the latest to fly home. A special plane was laid on by the Venezuelan government as part of its Back to the Homeland plan. Our correspondent Denise Herrera was at the airport in Quito as they boarded. Hello, yes, we are still at the Mariscal Sucre Airport, where around 90 Venezuelan people are living today. Ecuador, this was a really uh, difficult day and because they were living uh, many testimonies, they were sharing many testimonies about their life here. They are also, as we can see behind me, uh, they are the last passenger are boarding today and leaving Ecuador. It was a very, uh, very emotional day with, with this People. They are very happy to have the possibility to return to the country now. So, Denise, did they tell you why they were leaving Ecuador? Yes, we hear many testimonies about these, uh, these experiences here. They say that several they share several situations of xenophobia and labor explo exploitation. They say they, say they, ha they didn't have the possibility to find a war here. And also, they say that uh, they missed so much their families and they say now they are very thankful with President Nicolás Maduro to have the opportunity to come back to their country, to Venezuela finally. That was Denise Herrera from Quito. The Venezuelan embassy in Quito will create a special commission to assist migrants in applying for their return to the homeland program. The commission will also help their citizens cope with attacks against them which have been called xenophobic by the government of Venezuela. We are confident that 70 to 80 percent of the migrants are going to return as economy will recover. Anyways, we want to denounce an international campaign aimed at presenting migration as a humanitarian crisis. A humanitarian crisis means war, general famine or persecution. That is not the situation in Venezuela. Venezuela is dealing with an economic war. We are suffering attacks against our economy. We also want to denounce the xenophobia promoted against our migrants. Venezuela's representative at the Organization of American States has rejected a session held this Wednesday to talk about Venezuelan migration. Samuel Moncada said the meeting was an attack on Venezuela's sovereignty. A number of countries wanted to use the extraordinary session to invoke the democratic charger of the OAS against Venezuela. Thank you very much. We reject the call for this extraordinary session of the Permanent Council and again regret the recording practice of this organization of not consulting at any time our opinion. Once again, this is a sign of hostile and unfriendly attitude of those who call this meeting towards Venezuela. We want to record the vigorous rejection by our Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela of this meeting. It is again being used as a platform to attack our country through a selective and clearly politicized approach to Venezuelan reality. So we also want to make clear that we reject the meeting, its results, its decisions and anything else that comes out of it. This will not be applied and will not be of no consequence for us. The ELN has freed three soldiers in an attempt to restart peace talks with Colombia's new government. The soldiers were detained in early August. On Tuesday, the group announced that it would release the detain, despite the fact that the Colombian government has not given securities for this process. A military airplane belonging to the United States will be tested in Ecuador. Ecuador's Vice Minister of Defense, Diego Gomez, has announced the test will start on Thursday. Gomez says the operation will increase the coordination of both countries in the fight against crime. But critics say Ecuador is giving up on its, on its sovereignty. 
Guatemala has banned the head of the Commission Against Impunity, Ivan Velázquez, from entering the country. President Jimmy Morales expelled the UN mission over the weekend. According to Morales, the head of the commission is, quote, a threat to national security. The decision to expel the commission has sparked protests. Social organizations have criticized the president for trying to derail the corruption investigation involving him. Paraguay has announced it will move its embassy back to Tel Aviv from Jerusalem. Paraguay's Foreign Affairs Minister made the announcement a little more than three months after the embassy was transferred to Jerusalem. Paraguay's new president, Mario Abdo Benitez, took the decision, citing his desire to contribute to peace in the region. Paraguay wants to contribute to the intensification of regional and international diplomatic efforts in order to achieve a wide, fair and lasting peace in the Middle East. Soon after the announcement, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu ordered the closure of Israel's embassy in Paraguay. A statement from his office said on Twitter that Israel views with utmost gravity the extraordinary decision by Paraguay, which will cloud bilateral relations. Our correspondent in Paraguay, Osvaldo Sayas, has more details. The Minister of Foreign Affairs of President Mario Abdo Benitez's government has announced that the Paraguayan embassy in Israel will return to Tel Aviv. This after the government of his predecessor Horacio Cartes moved the Paraguayan embassy in Israel to the city of Jerusalem, a territory in dispute. Castiglione affirms that in this way Paraguay returns to a position of respect for international relations since the United Nations recommends not to move embassies in a unilateral way in the city of Jerusalem. In 2017, Cartes' decision unleashed a series of criticisms. Above all, the need to respect the rights of Palestinian people to live in peace on their lands and a need for condemnation of Israeli aggression against Palestine. Coming up, more stories. We'll be back. Welcome back. We continue with our stories. Brazil's federal police says there are indications that President Michel Temer received bribes from the construction company Odebrecht. Prosecutors say the head of the MDB party could have received more than $300,000 through intermediaries. The state attorney will decide if it brings forward the accusation, which will be the third time it does so. Two of Temer's ministers are also accused of corruption. At the UN Security Council, Russia and China have demanded that the United States respects Nicaragua. They stated that the country is not a threat to international peace and should not be submitted to a discussion of any kind. They demand the respect for the nation's self-determination. Russia's diplomatic mission at the UN also tweeted that if the U.S. really wants to help Nicaraguans, it should lift the economic sanctions. Russian Representative Vasily Alexievich 
said that Washington must abandon its colonialist acts, such as the NICA Act and the end of the temporary protection for migrants. Government workers demonstrated in Argentina's capital in Buenos Aires in support of those fired from the state news agency Telam. Our correspondent Edgardo Esteban has the details. The state workers are supporting the people who were fired from the state news agency Telam. The press unions are also mobilizing in Buenos Aires to bring awareness to the difficult situation that those fired are suffering. 357 workers were dismissed more than two months ago meaning 40% of the agency's collaborators. There are still no answer from the government of Mauricio Macri. Demonstrators are asking the Federal Secretary of Public Media to respond. Five people have been reincorporated, but they want to negotiate others to have the same opportunity. People reach the headquarters building of Telam, and they will continue with their struggle until they receive answers from the authorities. Edgardo Esteban from Buenos Aires. Hundreds of Argentinians have also protested against the government's decision to cut the budget for the health ministry. Health workers, union members and political and social organizations protested outside the health ministry in Buenos Aires. As a part of the ongoing austerity push, the government closed down 11 ministries and cut spending on public policies. We are here demanding that the Argentine government gives us back the Ministry of Health. People who are suffering from chronic diseases can't live without a ministry. People with HIV, we need to have the guarantee of having antiretroviral in the country. It's a very big change implemented by the government in the health sector. The lack of guarantees from the state on public health, a 25% cut in the personal budget, and also of all the essential services. Argentina's peso has gained more than 1% and financial stocks surged on Wednesday. This comes just after government officials were in Washington seeking emergency funding to stem the economic crisis. Argentina's finance minister, Nicolás Duhovny, met with the head of the IMF, Christine Lagarde, in Washington on Tuesday. They were expected to talk about new conditions for the fund to speed up payments on a $50 billion deal. But Duhovny didn't provide details and said they are hoping for an improved bailout loan in the second half of September. President Mauricio Macri has been accused of abuse of power over the agreement he signed with the IMF. Macri and his ministers are accused of violating the Constitution by not seeking congressional approval for the loan. The state prosecutor presented the case in court and said that it is now up to the judiciary to rule if he will suspend the agreement. The national dialogue is underway in Honduras to resolve last year's controversial presidential election. The talks are beginning after nine months of failed attempts. A United Nations representative says each side is equipped with delegates committed to international mediation and each committee is expected to present solutions at the end of the dialogue. Students at the National Autonomous University of Mexico, UNAM, are striking after violent groups attacked them on Monday. Two people were seriously injured during a peaceful demonstration. Students are demanding that the university ensures for their safety on campus. So far, 18 members belonging to these groups have been expelled from the university. The demonstrations are happening as the 50th anniversary of the Tlatelolco student massacre approaches. On October 1968, a student demonstration was violently detained, leaving around 400 people dead. Over 1,300 protesters were arrested that day. Guyana's teachers' strike is in its third day. Since Monday, students have been turned away as teachers failed to show up for classes. Teachers again gathered in front of the education ministry to continue protesting. They're asking for a 40% wage increase, which the government says it's too expensive to pay. 
Bolivian President Evo Morales has blamed Chile for unilaterally suspending a meeting to discuss the maritime border issue. Morales expressed his disappointment over the cancellation of the meeting, which was agreed by both sides. Bolivia had asked to negotiate sovereign access to the Pacific Ocean. For generations, both countries have been fighting over the border. In 2013, landlocked Bolivia filed a case at the International Court of Justice demanding that Chile grant them access to the ocean. Chile, Chile unfortunately, has a policy of delay. These meetings were planned ahead from both the sides. Why so many commitments? Why there have been so many offers and even OAS resolutions for Bolivia to get a sovereign corridor to the Pacific Ocean? They make us believe and then suspend any treaty that needs to continue and have results. This suspension of the meeting has surprised me. And as we talk about Bolivia, it will have a new universal healthcare system by 2019. This new system will provide free medical care for every citizen. The National Treasury will fund its insurance plan. This initiative comes after an extensive debate with social movements, institutions and health sectors. We'll take one last short break, but you can stay with us. An occasion to enjoy the cultural diversity that defines our South American essence. Come along to find out the story behind these personalities, traditions, and artistic expressions that unite us as a whole. Real Lives. Saturdays, only on Telesur. Welcome back. In Afghanistan, a double suicide bombing at a wrestling club in Kabul has killed at least 20 people and injured 70 on Wednesday. After a suicide bomber killed four people, a second bomber in a car attacked emergency services that were responding to the incident. The neighborhood is home to many members of the Hazara minority. I was training in the Western Club when suddenly I heard firing of bullets. My friend said it was firing and ran to open the door the moment we heard the sounds of explosion. I saw that all people, including jokes, were spread around the scene of suicide attack. Somalia's food security has improved, but recovery remains fragile. A new report presented by the UN Food Security Nutrition Analysis Unit noted a major improvement in the country's food security. This less than a year after Somalia overcame its worst drought in decades. However, a third of the country's total population is still in need of humanitarian assistance. And 1.5 million people still face a food security crisis. We have seen a, a agricultural production that exceeded the expectation and we've seen the number of people in need fall overall from 5.4 million to 4.6 million. And the number of people within that group who are in crisis and emergency, the very worst situation of food insecurity and malnutrition, that number has also fallen from 2.7 million to 1.6 million. So these are very encouraging numbers. At least three firefighters have been killed while trying to contain a deadly fire in Johannesburg, South Africa. One firefighter fell into the blaze while trying to save others. 13 people have also been seriously injured and taken to a local hospital in Gauteng. The fire broke out on the 23rd floor of the health department building. The cause of the blaze is not yet known. But I think I just want to give our deepest condolences. This is one of the most devastating things that uh, you know, ever happens in a city where we lose our firefighters or police officers. But EMS is out here in full force. Uh, together with our colleagues uh, from the Gauteng department and also the, uh, uh, the paramedics from the uh, private uh, uh, rescue uh, institutes. 
the China-Africa Cooperation Summit has ended and many African leaders have praised this outcome. We've talked to a development economist from Kenya who gave us a global perspective with an African lens on the significance of the summit. I think the significance of FOCAC is that it came during a time when Sino-African relations were really being scrutinized um, in the context of, of debt. Um, we've always seen Sino-African relations being scrutinized, particularly by Europe and North America. And I think the signal that the Chinese government wanted to communicate to Africa first and to the world second is that they have a smart way and they have they're beginning to come up with the solutions to some of the problems that are emerging in Sino-African relations. And I think that was very important in terms of helping people understand that the engagement between China and Africa is not static, that it's always evolving, and that that will be the way it will continue to be going forward. And she told us that she also does not believe that China is engaging in any sort of debt trap in diplomacy. On the contrary, she says, it is the African governments who have an appetite for debt. So the debt trap diplomacy narrative is just the newest version of the xenophobic narrative. So as an economist sitting in Africa, I'm like, well, what will the next one be? Because as I said before, this xenophobic narrative seems less concerned with what Africa is going through and seems more focused on painting China as the bad guy because there seems to be this ideological warfare for the hearts and minds of Africans. A powerful magnitude 7 earthquake has struck Japan. According to the U.S. Geological Survey, the earthquake hit 112 kilometers southeast of Sapporo at a depth of 66 kilometers. It confirmed that the offshore earthquake has not caused a tsunami. 10,000 counter-protesters overshadowed a protest held by Germany's far right in Hamburg. Around 180 far right protesters gathered to demand the resignation of German Chancellor Angela Merkel. Their small demonstration was put to shame, however, by a far bigger counter-protest, which police estimated some 10,000 people attended. While far-right supporters waved Germany flags and banners urging Merkel to step down, the counter-demonstration came with banners condemning hate. The rival protests were separated by barricades of police and water cannons. An installation at an exhibition in the northern Spanish town of Gexo allows its visitor to jump onto a giant mat adorned with a picture of U.S. President Donald Trump. People climb a short flight of stairs to take a dive onto a mat imprinted with a giant picture of the U.S. President. The festival's theme this year is post-conflict, and the exhibitors believe that there is no better one to illustrate this than Donald Trump. The artists of the installation, Dutchman Eric Hessels and Thomas Maylander, say that jumping on the face of the most powerful man in the world gives you a feeling of liberation and catharsis that even if only for some seconds makes you feel as if you are taking revenge against him. So it does seem to have permeated because this has had a lot of repercussion. And with that, we come to the end of this news brief. For this and many other stories, you can find on our website at telesurtv.net slash English. You can find all our top stories through countries and through topics as well. Be sure to also follow us on social media. We have on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. For Telesur English, I'm Carla Gonzalez. Thank you for watching.